Welcome to our second keynote of the summit with Sylvester McNutt III. We are just so incredibly happy and honored to have you, Sylvester. Thank you for being with us tonight. Likewise, just, it's know, great to be in this space. Yeah, we've had we've had the most amazing. I've just been receiving all this positive feedback and all these words of like people are just loving your material and your wisdom and everything you have to share, Sylvester. It's um, I think, you know, it's, it is a journey, this healing journey we're all on together, right? Um, so I'm just really excited to hear um, what you have to share with us tonight. So when, as you join, please join the chat, tell us um, where you're from. And if you have questions for Sylvester during the last half of the hour, please um, ask those through the chat. I will be watching that and asking Sylvester as when we do the Q&A. So I wanna start by honoring and thanking the Coast Salish people the original caretakers of the land that I call home in Victoria, BC. I appreciate those who have taken care of the beautiful land and waters that I call home. And let, um, let me introduce Sylvester McNutt III. Sylvester is an eight time author whose most notable books, Care Package, A Path to Deep Healing and Free Your Energy have helped millions of people improve their spiritual selves and lives. He created the Bound Build Your Boundaries program where he teaches how to build healthy and effective boundaries. To date, he's recorded over 100 episodes of the Free Your Energy podcast. I'm, I'm making my way through them. And they're fantastic, Sylvester. Sylvester is passionate about how we can free our energy. He believes that healing is the key to success. Tonight, he'll be speaking to us on the art of deepening relationships. And Sylvester, we're just so excited to learn from you. So thank you. Thank you. I wish I wish I had an intro like that every morning when I woke up. And I'm getting out of bed, getting my coffee. I would just dominate the day. So uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it away and uh, let's go on a little journey. So when it comes to deepening relationships, um, a lot of the times we we seek external, right? We seek the external relationship, the you know the relationship with mom and dad, the the husband and wife, the bro boyfriend girlfriend. And, you know, all the beautiful things that nothing wrong with that. But for me, what I found is the precursor to all other relationships is the relationship that we have with self. Um, so for my component and for my keynote, it's so crucial that we start off with talking about self-love. Now, the timing of the summit is excellent because I just finished writing my book and I'm actually in the, in the midst of recording the audio book right now to be finished this upcoming weekend. And so the book is called Loving Yourself Properly. And when we originally met, we talked about the timing and it's perfect timing that I finished a book that has taken me two years to write. And so I've really got to sit with um, this work and answer the question, what is self-love? You know, because we hear so many people say, oh, just love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. And for me, that was always confusing. I always said to myself, what does that mean? Just love yourself. Like, what, what does that actually mean? So it's been fun for me to the last two years to go on this pragmatic journey of asking questions and diving deep into different experiments, uh, researching, reading different things, interviewing different people, and coming up with what I feel like is a, a framework for self-love. Um, and so I want to say that the dissension and the ascension, they're two different things emotionally, right? The ascension is often... Um, what feels good, you know, a lick of ice cream, you see a dog, a kid waves at you, uh, someone, someone that you love kisses you in the cheek, gives you a hug. That's the ascension. Those are the things that we look for in life. Those are the things we seek. Those are the things we chase. Uh, other things that feel like ascension is uh, someone writes you a love letter. Someone buys you some, some flowers. Um, did I say a piece of chocolate? You know, a piece of chocolate if I didn't say that. Okay. Um, the descension though, Grieving, sorrow, anxiety, fear, uh, loss, uh, confusion, right? Those are like the descension emotions, the um, um, stagnation, being stuck, feeling uh, stale or bored even. And so typically, uh, my first invitation to you is to ask you how you felt when you heard me name the emotions. You know, I use the word energy a lot. And everything that we say contains energy. 
everything, how we interpret things, there's an energetic response. So when I say things like puppy, dog, baby, chocolate, right? You can even see it on my face. There's a smile. It's like, oh, that, feel, that feels good. Puppies, chocolate, babies. Yeah, I want that. But then when I say grief, sorrow, pain, loneliness, oh, that's the dissension. So just for a second, my very first invitation to you is to tap into this question. How did you feel when you, you hear those words? Well, our human, our, the way we're designed, we typically want to go towards what feels good. And we typically want to figure out how to avoid what doesn't feel good. And this is how a lot of our, our strategies are set up, whether it's a survival strategy, a dating strategy, a friendship strategy. We try to avoid what is bad and we try to go towards what's good. So my question to you is this, are you a human being? Yes, you are, okay. So since you are a human being, then how can you effectively choose to avoid half of the experience? Is that an effective choice? Right, in psychology, there's this term called uh, spiritual bypassing, which is a term by, uh, I believe it's Dr. John Woodman. You can check, you can, you can Google that real quick and check, make sure I said his name right. I believe it's Dr. Woodman. And basically spiritual bypassing is using spiritual terms or psychological terms to skip a step, right? In a process or to skip an emotion or to skip an experience or to uh, skip a feeling. But what happens if you're in Target tonight and you're checking out and someone tries to skip you in line? Well, you're going to be pissed. Why? Because you wait, you waited in line. Why? Because that's the process. You did the process. You wait in the line until you get to the cashier and then you check out. But then with that same framework, when we come look at our lives, we try to skip steps, right? We try to just get over it. And we often say, uh, thank you. Well, would, well, would, thank you. Uh, and then we'll often say things like, oh, well, just get over it or just love yourself. And we also, we often use the word self-love as a spiritual bypassing technique. And so my invitation to you is to break up with that and to look at self-love as the holistic view of the human experience. The holistic, holistic means whole. So the ascension and the descension. So if we claim that we're going to use self-love as one of our vessels and as one of our tools to love ourselves, that means that we're great and we want the puppy and the kid and the chocolate uh, and the play and all, the, all this stuff that is the ascension. But it means that we also make space and we create a vessel for the descension, for the sorrow, the pain, the discomfort, the breakup, the 20 year friendship that is now broken up as you guys are adults, the friends that fade away. Self-love, step one, is to see life holistically and to make space for the entire, entirety of it, not just the ascension. Okay. Uh, so let's go to the descension part. Let's talk about that, right? The deepening, the deepening of relationships. The alchemists, they use this terminology called the negredo and vessel. Those are the two terms that they use. Okay. It may, you may also see it pronounced as negredo. Uh, and so what that is, is let's just say you're in a place where you're describing your dissension and you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm stuck. I don't feel good. Uh, you fill in the blank. I won't, I won't waste our time using that. You fill in the blank. I don't feel good. I'm stuck. Fill in the blank. You know what comes along with those type of things, right? And so what happens when you go into the dissension? Well, when you go into the dissension, you need a vessel, right? You need a vessel. Why? You need a vessel because you want to cook the material of your life cook, you know, metabolize, process, all kind of the same thing here. So we want to metabolize the material of our life. So if my goal right now is, hey, I have this goal of I want to get a relationship, right? I want to be in a relationship, enter a relationship, make my marriage better, make whatever it is, right? Something relationship wise. And then let's just say you have another goal over here, um, something career wise. I'm sure we all have career goals. And then let's just say in the middle, you have some type of a fitness goal, you know, maybe more yoga, more walks, right? Typically, people usually have one goal in each one of those pillars, right? And that's the relationship with self. Often work is the relationship with self and community. And then a partnership is often relationship with self and intimate 
partnership, all different types of relationships. But what happens if we only make space for the ascension in those relationships? Well, that is how we avoid deepening. How we choose to deepen each one of those relationships is we figure out what vessel can make space for each person in the relationships. So if it's a business relationship, right? COVID happens. We have to let go of someone. We bring on somebody new, right? What is the vessel? Do we have open communication, right? Do we have leadership that's poor? Do we have unclear communication? You bring it to the relationship with yourself. And let's say you have a goal about fitness or eating or sleeping, right? Which is your wellness. How you treat yourself is your wellness. Okay, well, what happens if your vessel isn't there? You're not following through with your workouts. You, my, the number one problem that I have that I'm working on is snacking too much. Snacking too often and having too big of a portion. So how did I fix that? Well, I asked my community for help. When I tried to do it on my own, I couldn't do it. Why? Because I love chocolate too much. And I didn't have the discipline. I didn't have the control. But I knew that overeating the chocolate wasn't good for me. I didn't like the way I felt. I didn't like feeling addicted to sugar. So what did I have to do? I had to create a safe vessel for myself and I had to be vulnerable and I had to ask for help from my community, from my partner and from my two-year-old kid. He doesn't understand it, but I talked to him about it. Why? Because it, it makes me feel good. It makes me get it off of my chest. And then in my relationship, I actually, I literally took this situation to my partner and I, we had an hour long conversation about making sure we could get on the same page because I wanted to make sure that she was supporting me and that I was supporting her, right? And so it would be great to just say, oh my God, my job is great, yeah, do it. And then we never make space, we never create the vessel for the negrito. The, the negrito is the suffering, is the pain. The negrito is the emotional space. So instead of having all these emotions, just doing this and we're just jumping, no, we'll grab it and we put it in a vessel. We just put it in a vessel. And then the vessel is the conversation about it the acknowledgement of it, right? No spiritual bypassing. We want to totally authentically process our experience. So when the job has a thing called, boom, we bring it down. Let's, let's create a vessel for this. Let's create a vessel for this conversation. Do that with yourself, boom. Let's, let's create a vessel for this. What do I need? What do you need to support yourself fully? Obviously doing some, a keynote like this, doing a summit like this, this is supporting you. Maybe you could find two to three seconds to thank yourself for showing up. This is you supporting yourself. Making a safe space to have conversation in your relationship, intimate relationship, that's you creating a vessel for the negrito, for the suffering, for whatever needs to be cooked, metabolized, cooked, whatever needs to be processed. The, um, in Latin, there's this phrase, um, prima materia. Prima materia means prime matter. So when you look at your life, and let's just, let's just make this very simple. I'll give you one very simple situation. Let's just say, let's just assume a person's in a relationship and it's turbulent, okay? So that's the prima materia, prime matter. The prime matter of your life right now is that you are in a turbulent relationship. So what do we want to do with that? But we need to, one, acknowledge. This is how we deepen. We acknowledge. If we don't acknowledge, then what do we do? We spiritually bypass. So what does that mean? We skip. We skip the line. What happens to people who skip the line? Right? So we don't do that. We don't skip. We acknowledge. We acknowledge. And when we acknowledge, what do we use? We use a vessel. What is a, a vessel? If you see, every time I say vessel, I'm putting my hands together. Why? Because the vessel has boundaries. The vessel has boundaries, it's not all of this. The vessel is, is this, right? So we need boundaries to access healing from whatever the prima materia is, whatever the prime matter is, whatever our struggle is, whatever our pain point, whatever, whatever that is, we need, a, we need a vessel. And so often, uh, I'll give you an, an example of a vessel, a men's group, a woman's group, your therapist, um, your personal trainer, uh, your hairdresser, <laughs> hairdressers probably don't want to hear, don't want me including them because they're like, I'm not your vessel. I'm here to do your hair. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, let's just be honest. For me, I go to my barber, and when, when I'm sitting with him for an hour, we talk about everything. I'm sure you could say the same thing. And so we have a bunch of different people and vessels. But what we also need is boundaries. We have to make sure that we have bound, boundaries. Otherwise, we're not respecting the vessel. So when we do engage with the hairdresser or barber, we can ask, hey, do you mind if I ask you about this one thing? Do you have the capacity to have this conversation? Maybe you're talking to a friend who doesn't have the knowledge or the emotional, um, the emotional strength to support you. That doesn't mean they're a bad friend. Maybe you need a therapist instead, right? One of the big, the best vessels I have right now is that I'm in two men's groups and we meet once a week. And what we'll do, I'm sharing this with you because it, it, it's literally a life-saving tool. Uh, one of the things that we'll do is we'll often buy books and we'll read different programs together, different books, different audio books, different programs. And sometimes we'll just meet and we'll just catch up and we'll just talk, you know, what's going on, what's in your life. Uh, there's about eight to 10 men in each group. If you do not have a men's group or a woman's group, I strongly recommend, and, and let me not just say men or women, there could be another group um, that could be better for you. You know, uh, It could be mixed. It doesn't necessarily have to be based on gender. It just so happens for me that I'm in two men's groups and we talk about men related issues. Um, so take that and you know, allow it to fit your, you know, fit your narrative. One of the group that, groups that I'm in is a worldly group. You know, There's people um, from Australia and Canada and America. And then one of the other groups that I'm in uh, is strictly African-American men, un except for one guy who I just, I just invited this one guy, uh, and he's actually Mexican. And when the African-American group started, that was part of the niche focus. It was, uh, hey, let's bring some Black men together so we can create a space for our emotional wellness. Uh, now that we've been together for a year, I asked the guys in the group, I said, hey, you know, we came together under that premise, but I really think we should expand to just the men that would be compatible with this space. And I think we should get rid of the, uh, the black man component. And they were like, oh, that's great. So that's another thing that we have to recognize with the deepening of our relationships and with our relationship vessels is that they change and they, that we have to be okay with them changing. A lot of people suffering in relationships comes from the, ability, the, the lack of an adaptation to change. We have to be able to change in group dynamics or in one-on-one -on -one dynamics. We have to make sure that our vessels and our boundaries are fluid enough, right, to flow with change. All right, and I'm going to bring it home here. Let me just check my notes really quick. There was one thing I wanted to make sure that I got through. Okay. When I was a younger, let me tell you why I got started with the work that I do. When I was younger, um, I had the perfect family structure. I was the oldest kid. So, you know, I come into the world. The world is all about me. It was me, mom, and dad. And it was perfect. I remember fishing with my father. I remember, uh, what is that? Knitting, knitting with my mom. I remember playing cards with them. I remember cooking with my mom. Um, Oh man, so many beautiful memories. I was about to get teary out here, but I'll do that later on. <laughs> Just so many, so many beautiful memories. I remember them, you know, my dad tickling my mom, uh, them flirting, them holding hands, just being together, you know, doing the thing where they both grab one of my hands and they like lift me up. I remember that. And then, um, you know, my brother and sister come along and everything changed. Everything changed. It went from love you know the the healthy relationship the healthy family system the healthy family structure it went from a completely loving environment and it shifted to uh it was an, it became abusive both both parents became alcoholics uh my mother became emotionally unavailable which is a completely different contrast than how she was before right and my dad became physically and emotionally abusive which again was a complete contrast to how he was before. So when you're a young kid and you can recognize this, I was a very intuitive kid. Uh, I was an honor student. I was very smart in school. School was really easy and it was also super boring, <laughs> but it was easy. And 
I could recognize this change in the family structure, but obviously I was a kid, so I didn't have language. I didn't have understanding. One of my favorite um, psychotherapists, his name is Francis Weller, he has this program called, uh, the program is called An Apprenticeship with Sorrow. And he talks about sorrow, he talks about grief. And one of, the, one of the things he says in there is that it's the adult's responsibility to help the children metabolize their pain. Children don't have the language to understand their pain. And so when I was a kid, I'm about 10, 11, 12, 13, I was trying to metabolize the pain of my family structure, my family system, going from literally the perfect family system and family structure to the worst. And I could not understand it. So the very first healing mechanism, coping mechanism that I turned to was journaling. Um, and so I, would get, I got a journal and I fell in love with journaling. I fell in love with it. And it was so funny. I was like an investigative reporter because I would sit in the living room when my parents would argue or I would sit in the kitchen and I would literally, I would write down everything. I would write down facial expressions. I would, I would write down what they were saying, the words they were using. I was watching their tone. I was looking at uh, body language, right? And I didn't know, I didn't know everything. Like the way I do now, I'm not saying I know everything now, but I'm just saying I, I didn't have the language for it. And so I'm just writing all this stuff down. And I used to keep it in my bed, the, my journal, I used to keep it right in my bed, uh, in the, between the mattress and the frame. And uh, what ended up happening for me is when I got to high school, my counselor, she saved my life. She absolutely saved my life. She, she was like a mother figure. Her name is Barb Schmidt. I uh, ended up getting 40 days of sus suspension my freshman and sophomore year from fighting, from uh, cursing at teachers. I threw a chair in one of my classes, uh, punching lockers. Now, what is that? Well, that's anger. Well, what is the anger consequence of? It's a consequence of being, being abused <laughs> first, uh, but being in a family structure that was unsafe for me. So my actions and reactions in school was because the landscape of my body, my mind, body, and soul, I was not safe. So when you don't feel safe, that's how you, you, that's how you behave. And so it was the last week of my sophomore year. This kid comes behind me and I had on, you know, raise your hand if you're old enough to remember using a Walkman. I had on my Walkman. <laughs> And I had on the earphones. And you, if you remember those earphones, they always hit the little cord, all right? And, I had, and, and so I'm just, I'm at the lunchroom, introverted, minding my business, sitting by myself, which I didn't mind. I know in the, in the movies, they make that seem like a big de deal or like that person's a loser. I didn't care about any of that. I wanted to be left alone because when I went home, I couldn't be alone. So lunch period and walking home was like the only alone time I could get. So I love sitting by myself. So this kid comes from behind me and he picked the wrong, he honestly picked the wrong kid to mess with. He grabs my headphones, pulls them back and he starts choking me with my headphones. Now, if you've ever, you know, it was only like a two second thing because I reacted. I ended up taking this dude and I, and he was smaller than me too. And I ended up throwing him over the lunch table and obviously I fought this kid. So this was the very last fight that I was in in high school. I go to my administrator's office I walk in, she's instantly disappointed. And she's just shaking her head at me, Mrs. Schmidt. She goes, Sylvester, why are you in here? She starts crying. This is my administrator at my high school. She starts crying. I, and she goes, I just see so much potential in you. I see so much good in you. And it just disappoints me that you continue to come into my office. You're one of the brightest students in the school. You're one of the smartest people I've ever, ever met, but you just disappoint me over and over. She goes, what is it that you need to change this behavior? What is it that you need to be your best self? What is it that you need to step into your power? And I, I'm actually getting goosebumps telling you this story. And uh, when I saw her cry, I said, that's what I needed. That's it. That's all I needed. She was a little confused. She was like, you know, you know, like, tell me more. And I go, I just needed somebody to care. I just needed somebody to show me a little bit of love. 
Because when I went home, I never saw tears. I didn't see anybody caring. Uh, what she gave me was words of affirmation. I didn't see anybody giving me words of affirmation. I didn't see anybody saying, come on, pushing me, challenging me. She said, you're worth more. You're smarter than this. You're better than this. What do you need? And just her creating that vessel by saying, what do you need was all I needed to make a change. Um, so I'm sure you're probably curious what happened next uh, with high school. So let me just finish telling you. Um, I had to meet with the superintendent. This was my 42nd day of suspension and my freshman and sophomore year. And obviously that's unacceptable. Meet with the superintendent, my assistant principal, the principal of the school and my mother. And um, they just, they pretty much had the same thing. Sylvester, we cannot keep you in this school. Um, you know, we gotta get you out of here. You're bad, you're this and that. She was fighting for me in the meeting. And they asked me, they said, well, what are you going to change? What are you going to do differently? And I said, you know, my whole life, and then I kind of gave them my whole life story up until that point as a 15 year old, I gave them my whole life story. But at the end of that meeting, I said to them, I said, I feel like this is the moment in my life where I commit to love. And they kind of looked at me like, commit to love? What is this, what is this dude talking about? This little 15 year old sophomore who they, they wanted to kick out of school. I said, yeah, like, this is it. This is, this, is, this is the moment where I commit to love. I'm not spending my time doing anything unless I love it. So you know what? I'm going out for your football team. I wasn't on, on, in sport. I says, I'm going out for your football team. I'm going out for your track. I love football. I watch football every Sunday. I love running. So I'm going out for your track. You know what else I'm going to do? I'm going out for your debate team. Because I love debate. I love, you know, people arguing and seeing how people think and feel. I love that. You know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to become an author. And they go, an author? What are you going to write about? I said, I'm going to write about love. I'm going to write about relationships. I'm going to write about healing. And I'm going to write about this moment. And I told them, I said, one day, I'm going to tell people about this moment. Because this is the moment that I decided that for the rest of my life, I'm committed to love. So whatever that means, loving myself, whatever that means, loving you, loving my neighbor, loving a person that I cannot tolerate, that I can't stand, loving my enemy, whatever that means, I have to figure out how to step into love. And so the consequence of that is what? Well, my junior and senior year, I never miss a day of school. I have no more fights. My football team won no games, but junior and senior year, I become the star of the team. We won a bunch of games. They created a scholarship for me in the state of Illinois that still exists to this day called the Most Improved Student. And they give that out every year to a person who basically uh, has a journey with mine where they improve. Get into college, study communications in college, walk onto the Division I football team. And when, by the time I got onto the football team, that's when I recognized, okay, I've had about two or three years staying committed to love. It was over for me at that point. I knew that I was on the right path and I knew that I couldn't give up the path of staying committed to love. So if you remember anything from this story, if you remember anything, just remember, I was in the Negrito. I was in those dark emotions that we talk about, that I talked about at the beginning. But there was a vessel for me and that vessel was one person saying, what do you need? And when she said, what do you need? That gave me the permission to actualize what I needed, what I wanted. So I'm gonna leave you with this. What do you need? Simply that, what do you need? I love that. Thank you for sharing your story, Sylvester. That's, that's super inspiring. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through our questions because we've got so many excellent questions. And Please. Sylvie is saying, thank you so much for sharing your story as well. Please, um, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat. I'll make sure that I ask them while okay. Sylvester's speaking. So yeah. The first question, Sylvester, is what is the difference between being patient with yourself and recognizing that healing is a journey versus being too easy on yourself and staying stuck in your comfort zones? I want to be kind and gentle with myself but I worry about letting that turn into stagnation instead of growth. Help. 
<laughs> I love the help at the end. <laughs> Can you repeat the first part of the question one more time? What is the difference between being patient with yourself and recognizing that healing is a journey versus being too easy on yourself and staying stuck in your comfort zone? One of the mindsets we have to throw away is all or nothing thinking. There is a lot of gray area in life. There are some things in life where you can and should stay stuck in your comfort zones. Uh, I don't really like the word stuck, but let's just say you should sit in your comfort zones. And there are some components in space of life, of life where you need to be challenged and pushed um, and, and open to change. So I think the very first thing you should do is offer yourself self-compassion for where you are self-compassion for where your mind is, for where your body is, for where your life is at this current moment. And through that compassion, if you, if you want to seek change through compassion, that's always the best way. That's always, always, always the best way. The second part of that question, can you re re repeat the second part of that question? I want to be kind and gentle with myself, but I worry about letting that turn into stagnation instead of growth. I wonder what it would feel like for you if you took out everything after the butt. Robin, read it again, but stop before the butt. I want to be kind and gentle with myself. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That is an affirmation right there. So when you wake up tomorrow, look in the mirror and say that. I want to be kind and gentle with myself. That's it. We don't need the butt. I want to be kind and gentle with myself. Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. And I love your answer. And I also think about this week and you talked about, or maybe it's your, I, I've just listened to your podcast. So I may be mixing up where we got, where I got this information. Right? You talk about this overthinking and it's like, we need to stop overthinking and just get to the doing. So sometimes it's just, maybe our minds are just too, we're, we're overthinking things. Could be. So Lily from California is asking, you talk a lot about energy, but could you explain or describe a bit about what you mean? How can we picture or understand this energy we're trying to heal or work with? It's very simple. Put your favorite song on right now and what happens. The music has an energetic vibration that comes into your body. And when that song comes on, you laugh, you scream, you cry, you're, you're, you start dancing, you start moving. Now put on a song that reminds you of a bad time, a sad time, that reminds you of a person you, you don't like, what happens? You're instantly like, oh no, I'm turning that off. <laughs> Skip, <laughs> let's get out of this playlist, right? What happens if you go sit outside and you just sit there and you let the wind, hopefully it's not cold where you are, but you let the wind just come and you sit there in that moment and you let the wind wrap around you and you appreciate and ground into that moment. What is that? You're feeling the energy of the earth. You're feeling the energy of the atmosphere. Pull out your journal and write, I love myself. I'm right where I need to be. And then say that out loud. And how do you feel? What emotional state are you creating? Right? And then try the opposite. Pull out your journal and write, I can't stand myself. I, I don't. Say that out loud, see how you feel. So everything is energy. Our entire world moves on vibration. What we're eating, as we metabolize our food, it takes energy, it takes heat to, to literally heat your body, to metabolize your food. So everything is energy. Great question. Abby from New Jersey is asking, what can I say to people in my life who are not supportive of my healing journey? Nothing. Simply put, not supportive. I feel like that's the most important word, word uh, sentence, or excuse me, the most two important words in that sentence is not supportive. Why do you feel a need to negotiate with people who are not supportive? Okay, so maybe the response is, well, this person is my mom, or this person is my friend, or this person is my brother, or this person is someone close to me. 
Okay. So then my question to you is this, why do you feel the need to gain the approval of people who are not supported? If you are doing something that is enhancing your vitality, enhancing your survival, enhancing your experience, and there are people who do not support that, then my question is, why do we care what they think? Great question. Kelsey from Phoenix is asking, what is one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Hmm. Okay. This is so hard, right? This is a butterfly effect question. If you go give yourself that, that piece of advice, does it completely alter and change your life? Probably does. Um, so let me, let me shift the question. I have a son, he's uh, about to be two years old. One of the pieces of advice that I'm gonna give him, I, I'll actually tell you a few. First, it's okay to fail. Allow yourself to fail over and over again, it's okay. Uh, second, I would tell him, it's okay to have fun. This world that we're in is all about being serious. It's all about domination. It's all about winning. It's all about, you know, killing it. What, 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 can, can we just have fun? Is it okay to have fun? Yeah, it's okay to have fun. It's okay to make space for seriousness and fun. But when I, when I look at him, the young kid version of him now, he just loves having fun. So at what point in life, in life, do we go from the kid or having fun to the serious adult who never has fun? And then we wonder why all of our mental health, well, not all of our mental health, but we wonder why mental health is such a thing. It's because we remove fun from adulthood. So I would, I, would, I would say, son, it's okay to be an adult and to have fun. My younger self, my younger self probably needed to hear, I love you. And that's not necessarily advice. So maybe I would just go tell that guy, I love you. Just like I would tell this version of me, I love you. That's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking, do you think it's possible to heal your energy while you're still stuck in the situation that wounded you in the first place for family and financial reasons? I don't know. That's the most genuine answer I could give to a question like that. I don't know. Because when we say that an environment or situation hurt you or wounded you, right? I don't know the complexity of what that means. And I don't know the depth of that. Um, I, imagine, I imagine if the people in the environment or place are attempting to recognize or holding space for the hurting, then yes, I think that healing is possible. But if they do not have the capacity or they're not making the attempts or there's not a safe vessel for the wounding, then I'm not 100% sure how we would heal in a place that hurt us and there is no space or efforts to heal. So my first answer is I don't know, but I hope that the context I gave can go a little deeper. Um, I would say this. I remember, you know, I moved from Chicago to Phoenix. And part of the reason that I moved from Chicago to Phoenix is I felt like the only way that I could truly heal myself was to completely leave the entire environment. Um, and that's because I felt like there was people who enabled my mother and father. I felt like there was people who were, who turned an eye to the treatment that my brother and sister and I received. And so, I chose not to hold that against them. I chose to forgive them, but I also chose to forgive them and to leave the space. The reason I chose to find forgiveness is because I didn't want to hold on to the pain. I didn't want to hold on to the anger. I did, I did not want to hold on to that. I wanted to be completely free. And I found that in my life, forgiveness, and in that specific situation, separation is what healed me. Now, I will say this, in my relationship, me and my partner, we, we have our son together, We've been together six years, wait, yeah, six years. And there has been woundings in our relationship, but also what exists in our relationship where there's woundings and where there's pain, where there's disagreements, even up until yesterday, right? 
there's also the space, the vessel to sit down and have any conversation, no matter how deep, no matter how dark, no matter how hard, no matter if she caused the pain or if it was me. We both have consistently chosen to meet each other in the space of healing. So if there is an environment where there's pain, you, you list it, whatever it is that's in that negrito, then my question is this, here's the pain, what's the vessel look like? If that vessel does not have the capacity to, to acknowledge the wound, to work with it, and I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, then I don't, I don't think we should stay there. Great question. I really, I, that, that is, that's, that's powerful stuff, Sylvester, what you just said, like you said, the vessel, um, you know, a, a healthy vessel allows you to meet in a space of healing. That's, that's beautiful. This is, um, this question is, is a little bit similar to the, the last question, but there's a little bit more detail. The question is, I'm feeling very stuck in my relationships, my physical space, thanks COVID, and in my work, but I don't know where to start because it seems like moving forward is on hold and those barriers are external, money, work, obligation, and not internal. How do I let everyone know I want to carve out this new space to move forward without blowing up my life? Because that seems like the only option. Hey, sometimes you gotta blow it up. You know, <laughs> I wanna, I wanna uh, share something really quick um, from my notes. So Francis Weller, like I, was, I mentioned him earlier, he talks about primary and secondary satisfactions. And so um, I'm, I'm sourcing this from his work, uh, The Apprenticeship with Sorrow, which is an audio program he created. And so he says the primary satisfactions are what shaped us as human beings. They helped us survive and helped us find out, find our place in the world. Uh, and so those are time spent in nature, sitting around the fire and telling old stories, sharing meals together, sharing dreams with other people, uh, times being held, whether they're being held for sorrow or grief in times of gratitude. And then what we're left with when you get out of the primary satisfactions is secondary satisfactions, he says. And uh, the secondary satisfactions um, are power, rank, status, achievements, wealth, success, and privilege. And so it's funny, if you, if you look at those secondary satisfactions, that's a lot of what our culture is. Power, rank, status, achievements, wealth, success, privilege, followers, likes, engagement, right? And so do me a favor, read the question one more time. I'm feeling very stuck in my relationships, my physical space, thanks COVID, and in my work, but I don't okay, right know there, right, there. right there, so when I hear that, I'm feeling very stuck. That makes me, when I hear the word, when I hear the word stuck, I'm thinking like me in this chair right now, I'm stuck. Is that true? Am I stuck? No, I have my emotions that may be happening, but am I, am I stuck? Not really. So my very first invitation to you would be to visit nature, to visit nature, to go on a nature walk, to go on a hike, to go to the ocean. Because if you feel stuck in your apartment, on your computer, in your emails, in your job, in your career, or you feel stuck because of COVID, maybe there's restrictions where you are. Maybe it doesn't feel normal to you or feel welcoming to you. There's no restrictions on nature, right? So I want you to visit nature. Why? Because that's one of the primary satisfactions for what we need to survive and thrive. Okay, read the rest of the question. I don't, know, I don't know where to start because it seems like moving forward is on hold and those barriers are external and not internal. How do I let everyone know I want to carve out this new space to move forward without blowing up my life? Perfect. Okay, so two things. So one, another one of the primary satisfactions is gratitude. So although you feel stuck, which is a beautiful emotion because it makes you acknowledge what's happening, where in your life can you find gratitude, All right? Where can you find gratitude? Were you able to work through the entire pandemic? 
while people lost their jobs. The fact that you're, you can attend a, a summit like this, can you find gratitude there for the privilege that it is to be here, to be able to receive the support and community? And I'm sure that there's plenty of other places in your life where you can find gratitude. Right? Gratitude is one of the most powerful healing emotions that we have. And lastly, when it comes to communicating, sometimes it's hard to communicate what we need to others when we're not 100% sure what we need. So what I feel like you should do is take a vacation, go to nature, spend two to three days in nature. And the intention of that trip should be to carve out some space to figure out what exactly do I need? And once you know exactly what you need, then it's much easier to ask the other people, you can use the language of, this is how you can support me. And then you can tell them, this is how you can support me. Great question. Robin, I think I just saw a text, someone texted a question. Could we maybe grab that one for the person who's present? Oh, I don't know. I'm looking at the chat right now and I don't see a question. I, I, I put in the chat, so I I'm, I'm, I'm wanted to um, remember to ask you for the list of um, primary satisfactions after we'll share it with our with the summit participants. Oh, got it. Okay, okay, got it. Okay. The next question is, after I've started my healing journey on my own, how do I apply it to my romantic relationships and finding a partner? I've been dating for what feels like forever and have been on a journey of self-reflection and self-healing. But people keep telling me it's too much or too intense when I try to be open and honest about it. Am I doing this honesty thing wrong? That's a great question. Too much, too intense. There is a such thing as too much, too intense when it comes to dating. Some people have different speeds and capacity for um, how, how they engage. Um, even if you look at the conversation of having sex on the very first date, some people will say, no, I would never do something like that because that's X, Y, Z. And some people will say, yeah, I'll do that. There's nothing wrong with that. So when it comes to dating, it's, it's so interesting. We all have different levels of comfort with how we reveal who we are, what we want, what we seek. Um, and yeah, it's, it's possible to give away too much information, to give away things too fast. Oftentimes that's perceived as um, clingy, right? So if you've gotten, my mother told me this when I was a young person, she says, if multiple people say the same thing about you and those multiple people don't know each other, there has to be some truth to it, right? So, you know, again, all or nothing thinking. Let's not use all or nothing thinking. But I can agree with my mom on that to a degree. Like, if multiple people interact with me, and multiple people are like, Sylvester, you're kind of a jerk. Like, well, I might be a jerk, especially if these people don't know each other, never interact with each other. Like, I actually might be a jerk. Now, maybe I was just a jerk to them because of what they did or said, but maybe I am a jerk, right? So I think that there's just a little bit of self-awareness needed there just to recognize, hey, am I... They use, a, uh, they use a phrase word vomit. Am I just vomiting here? Am I just vomiting words? Or am I being more intentional uh, with what I'm saying? And when I say be intentional, I don't mean overthink and hold back. I just mean have a little filter. <laughs> have a little filter. That's all. Now, there, you know, we do want to get to a, a space where we can be completely vulnerable and completely honest. But that does take time. And it's okay to take your time to get there uh, when you're dating. Great question. The next question is, I have a close family member who I feel violated a boundary I was very clear on. This person hurt me deeply by not respecting what I asked them and then blames me for somehow hurting them. I know I need to free my energy by forgiving this person. I do not see us being close again as I've lost so much respect with how I was treated. Any ideas for moving forward with this family member in a healthy way? Uh, you first, you are not obligated to forgive them. Forgiveness does help with healing, but forgiveness is a choice. And also you can heal and move forward 
without forgiving them. So you're not required to forgive them. You're also not required to bring them back in your life. Now, I don't know the depth of the boundary. I don't know the depth of the boundary violation. Um, but I would imagine, I would imagine uh, that the boundary violation severed trust. And when trust is severed, it's very hard and almost impossible in some situations to repair, again, unless the vessel meets the wound. And it, it seems like from the way that the question was worded, it seems like you want to move on and you want to move forward. And you also are allowed to do that. You do not have to give a person a second chance. You do not have to, you are not required to. If you feel that you want that, right? You can, but you're not required to, right? So I got, I got a question one time I was doing my, uh, my boundaries class and someone asked me, well, how many times can you allow someone to violate a boundary before you cut them off? The answer could be a hundred. The answer could also be once. It's up to you to determine what feels most appropriate to you. So if you give, if you offer or if you offer forgiveness, please make it genuine from your heart, but also recognize you're not required to. Hmm. One more thing. Um, what I like to do personally in relationships when I end them, if there was a relationship where there's history and there's past and you know, there's stories. If I feel worth it, I like to personally let the person know why I'm not interacting with them or talking to them anymore. That's just me personally. Because I, I don't like, um, Brene Brown says in her book, Dare to Lead, she says, she says, the worst thing you can be in a relationship is unclear. I love clarity. Like, I love clarity. So, hey, if I did something to hurt you, let me know. If you don't want to talk to me anymore, let me know. If, I'm going to return that to you. I feel like clarity is one of the most important things in relationships. So consider that. Consider the forgiveness piece and consider the potential of a closure conversation. But also note that you don't really owe this person anything considering you communicated your boundaries and they still chose to violate the boundaries after you clearly communicated them and hurt you deeply. So you don't necessarily owe the person forgiveness or the closure conversation. You just have those as tools for your healing process if they will help you. Sylvester, can you give us an example of that conver a conversation you've had with someone where at the end of a relationship, a clarity conversation? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we're going to go into the descent here. We have to go into the negrito, into the blackening, into the prima material, the prime matter. Most recently, a best friend of mine. Uh, I've been friends since college. And this person, you know, when people tell stories about endings, they often do it in a way where they make the other person the villain. That's how we, we learn to tell stories here in America. We do, uh, we make ourselves the um, protagonist <laughs> and everybody else is the antagonist. Everyone's against us. We make ourselves the hero. And I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna say that we grew apart and that we just don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. We just don't see eye to eye. Now, at one point, this person was my best friend. Um, you, you fill in the blanks, just like, I mean, just amazing friendship. And so, what I did was I thanked them. Before we got into the depth, I thanked them. When I got on the call, I said, you know, I really am very appreciative of you. And I just want to thank you for being my friend for all these years. And I didn't bring out the samurai sword and just say, we're never talking again. Like, I, I didn't do all of that. <laughs> I just said, I need some space from this relationship. And I explained why. And I also said that with the caveat of we can continue our friendship, but things would have to change. Certain conversations, there's certain conversations I'm not willing to enter anymore. There's certain environments I'm not willing to enter anymore. And so I named what I needed to feel safe in the conversation. And I just left it to that person. 
uh, not the conversation. I named what I needed in the conversation to feel safe in the relationship. And then I just left it there. And then that person has reached out and they have made some changes. And every change that they've made, I've made sure to acknowledge because they didn't have to make any change. So I made sure to acknowledge it. Hey, man, you know, good job. I really appreciate that. I'm so thankful for that. But genuine acknowledgement, not just saying, oh, I appreciate that. Like genuine, genuine. So the relationship ended and now a new one is being born. But the new one that is being born is taking its time and it's growing slowly. And I'm perfectly okay with it. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. The next question is, do you have any advice on letting go of mental blocks when it comes to freeing your energy? I try to do exercises like being appreciative of my life, finding joy, but I feel like my baseline is kind of pessimistic. And my reflex is always to find, thing, find that the good things aren't good or could be better. Well, very intelligent people and very aware people are often pessimistic. Uh, I know that because, well, let me not say that I'm intelligent, but I'm definitely aware. And I noticed that awareness brings pessimism because it makes you notice the problem, right? It makes you see what's ineffective. It makes you see what's going wrong. And so I don't feel like you need to completely get away from that because that could be who you are, right? You could be a problem solver. You could be uh, a thinker. You could be a person who puts puzzles together. You could be a great CEO, a great leader, because you're able to see all how the teams need to work together for success. So I don't look at that as if it's a bad thing. But to answer your question, it looks like you need a practice that helps you balance out the emotions that come with being pessimistic. Great. So go to yoga three times a week. Go to yoga. And when you go to yoga, set an intention before each class. And obviously the intention will change, but set an intention in each class. Today, you know, it could just be about for the next 60 minutes, I will not be pessimistic. So I'm not going to tell you to, to completely get rid of that trait because that trait might be very useful to you uh, in your personal life or professional life. But let's just balance the emotion. So bring yourself to yoga. And when you're in yoga, then you could potentially work on taming it. You don't have to get rid of it. You just want to come into communion with it. So then you could work on taming it through yoga, through breathing. Because what yoga does is yoga connects you with your body. It connects mind, body, and spirit. It connects psyche. It connects soul. It connects your brain and your heart. It's one of the only things that does that. Meditation is another thing that, that does that. Some say, if you ask some people the definition of yoga, some will say that yoga is moving meditation, right? Because what are we doing in yoga? Well, we're trying to connect, right? So I would say, start going to yoga and set an intention. Hey, I won't be pessimistic for the next 60 minutes. And then if you do find yourself being pessimistic while you're in yoga, simply use self-compassion. That's okay. It's okay that I was pessimistic. Now, once you use self-compassion, now you can ask yourself, can I release that? You can, right? But if you, if you look at the, hey, I'm, I'm sometimes I'm pessimistic. If you look at that as a negative thing or as a defect, what that will turn into is shame. Things that we feel that are defective about us, about how we think, about how we behave, turns into shame. But what's the consequence of shame? It makes you feel small. It makes you retreat. It makes you hide. It makes you feel worthless. It makes you feel unworthy. It makes you feel not important. So what do we need to defeat shame? We need empathy. So where can you find some empathy? You ask for a practice, your yoga practice. Your yoga practice can employ empathy for you. So again, no more all or nothing thinking. We want wholeness. So we want to be the person who, yeah, sometimes you're pessimistic, but also you are filled with joy and you are grateful. Great question. Well, I, the time is already up, Sylvester. It's been an hour and it's gone by so fast. I wanna thank you so very much. Can you, can we, can you spend a, maybe a minute or so and telling us what you are most passionate about these days, what you're working on? I know you said you just finished a book. Your ninth, that would be your ninth book, is that right? Yeah, so, you know, finishing the ninth book, um, 
I dealt with a, a lot of, um, what do we call that? Um, what's the term? I'm, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. The term when you don't feel uh, like smart enough to do the smart thing or good enough to do the good thing, uh, imposter syndrome. I dealt with a lot of imposter syndrome because what happened is when I put my last book out, Free Your Energy, uh, May 4th, 2019, it's been like two years, my author platform has really doubled and I didn't expect that to happen. When the pandemic first happened, my books re-hit the bestsellers list again because people were at home. So they're like, oh, I'm going to read now. I didn't expect that to happen. So there's been this newfound success, even though one could say I was already successful, but there's been uh, just more eyes on the work that I'm doing. And so what happened is as I moved into this new level of success, I felt a lot of like, why me? Like, why am, why am I here? Why am I, <laughs> you're reading my book, you know, like I felt a lot of imposter syndrome and I felt like that was a great journey because I felt like it was a part of what I needed to even put in the book in the loving yourself properly book, you know, because one of the, I remember one of the chapters I was uh, talking to people about doing affirmations. You, you know, how we talked earlier, how we're making sure we're using language that affirms who we are, who we want to be, and affirms our body and our, and our mind and our psyche. And I was saying to myself, like, wow, if you're depressed, affirmations can feel phony. Or if you're angry, an affirmation can feel fake. And I, I was dealing with like that imposter thing. And it was like, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful journey to go on to recognize, again, wholeness. Like, is it okay to actually feel like, man, why me? But then isn't it also okay to feel, yeah, me? Mm -hmm. And it was just like, it was just a beautiful journey. And that's what really brought me closer to wholeness, right? Um, in my life, I will say one of the things I'm really excited about is that I'm a dad. I never, ever thought I was going to be a father. I really thought I was just going to be one of those guys who would go through life and never have kids. And I have a kid. And again, it's like, there are some days I'm frustrated. And then there are some days I'm like, look at this beautiful baby. Let me just give him a kiss and hug him and squeeze him and chase him. And so uh, I'm excited about the journey of, of being a parent. And lastly, I'll just say, uh, I'm really excited about my yoga practice. You know, just really excited about it. I like to lift weights and do yoga. And I'm just really excited because I've got a lot of healing. I've got a lot of clarity and a lot of, a lot of purpose. And I, I hope to, when I get my book out, I hope to actually take a teacher training uh, and get certified. I, I'm not really passionate at this moment about trying to teach yoga, but I am passionate about doing it. And I want to really deepen my, passion, my, my practice by getting a teacher certification. So I got some great things going in my life and I'm, I'm just really excited and grateful to be here. Well, I, I know I'm speaking on behalf of everybody um, here tonight and those that are going to listen to the recording. I just want to thank you so much for an amazing week and for this hour. Um, you've just been so inspiring. And I'm, I'll be rewatching just so I can take in more, right? Because the more we can, I think, just hear it again, it'll, it'll just digest, as you, you said that word a few times tonight. So metabolize, right? Metabolize. <laughs> Last thing I want to say is this, is wherever you are in life, that's, that's a great spot. You know, take time before you go back to work, go to emails, take time to find some gratitude for where you are. Take time to find some appreciation for where you are. Take time to think about all the things that you've overcome. So take time to think about all the successes and all the victories. You know, there's so much power and so much love in the present moment. And part of deepening relationship is to come present. And the world we live in, yes, it's very pragmatic to think about your goals and your future and your business and your degree and all these things, right? And it's also very easy to think about your past, what didn't go right and what, all, right, all, very easy to do, right? And I'm not telling you that's wrong, but I am asking you and inviting you to just find some grace for yourself and self-compassion. That is how we deepen the relationship with self. And as a consequence of that, the relationship we have with ourself is the precursor for all other relationships. If you deepen that relationship with yourself by using self-compassion and empathy, shame gets out of there, fear gets out of there, and those do not come in to your relationship with others. And that's where the love is. So thank you so much, Robin, for bringing me on. Thank you so much. And, and in closing, I always close with a blessing. And so, and it's really uh, all along the lessons we've learned from you all week. 
May we always honor the people in our lives by thanking them for their time, their efforts, their energy, and for showing up in our lives. May we dive deep in order to understand ourselves better. May we accept that there are aspects of ourselves we love and aspects of ourselves we do not like. May we amplify what we love and work on the parts of ourselves we do not like. May we give ourselves grace and love and compassion as we undergo a lifelong process of healing and growth. May we practice forgiveness, forgiveness of self and forgiveness of others in order to free our energy. And may we be present. May we remember that we are all growing, we're all evolving, and we're in this together. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Sylvester. It's been an honor. Good night. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye.